question, we found that can metals near polar quantum critical points host uh, strongly correlated phases? And of course, the question is, what about superconductivity? Now this, unlike what we talked about before, this is going to be very strongly motivated by experiment. So superconductivity in dilute quantum critical polar metal. Well, the poster child here is electron doped strontium titanium. And because this is a, a, a material that's been studied for a long time, I, I would have all my slides full of references and I can't do that. So as a result, I'm sending you, if you're interested, to some two excellent reviews which have these references. This is a review by Carmen Denia and his colleagues in the annual review on that. And they've done a really nice job of going over strontium titanate. So strontium titanate, we have a TC as a function of density. Okay, now this is very similar to the plot that we saw in the so shortly in 1967 when it was originally found. More recently, with depending on doping, you have uh, you can actually go to lower density to see superconductivity. Um, and for the kinds here, when I say dilute, uh, you know, I mean low carrier density. And remember that we discussed this last time. The because of the large dielectric constant and therefore the large bore radius, uh, this can is this system. Uh, goes from insulator to metal at very low So, depending, TF is approximately 20 Kelvin, something like that for the density signal. The, the by temperature is about 400 Kelvin. So, TF is much, much less than T to by. Okay. And so, recall that, for example, for PCS, we normally have fast electrical and slow phonons. Here we have the opposite way around. So the standard BCS scenario doesn't work. Okay. Question? Yes. Is uh, what's known about the super the, the penetration depth? Penetration depth, all that I know is that it's comparable. It's larger. Okay. It's lo this is a type two superconductor. But I would, I think it would be really good to have it revisited uh, with some of the pure materials. And to my knowledge, that hasn't been done. Cameron has talked about doing some experiments. Has it, has it been measured? Has In the been past, measured? yes. That's how they know it's type two. Okay, but they're very close. They're very close. Yeah. And for example, I know nothing about the flux lattice phase in this system, even though it's type two. Uh, Psi and lambda are very close. So it's type two, but for example, I've never seen anything about the flux lattice phase in this system. So I don't know. Did you have a question? Okay. I thought you put your hand up. All right. So what we have is we have slow electrons and we have fast phonons. We have an inversion of energy scales. TF is much less than TD. Okay. We have, but what's interesting is just when you think that, okay, and remember, this is a system where phonons are definitely involved. But what's interesting is we have two delta over TC is about 3.5. It's the, it's the BCS value. So it's a little bit of a tantalizer. On the one hand, TF is much, much less than TB. So the standard BCS, we have an inversion of time scales. Uh, what's, and we are going to be focusing in this area here. And the reason I say that is because it, though I wanted to show you the full picture of the densities, it's not clear that we have bulk superconductivity at that low density, it's filamentary. Okay? So we're going to focus on low density, but not quite as low. But even there, EF is less than any phonon frequency. Okay. Um, there was some work early after BCS in the 60s uh, by Larkin, Pearsoff, and Gorevich, where they were interested in the possibility of superconductivity in semiconductors. They thought about polar superconductivity, but they were worried because they said they needed some phonon. We're going to be looking at the region 
today, where we don't have any phonons that seem to be uh, less than EF. Of course, if you go to higher densities, that's a different story. But we're going to be looking at this. So, what are the challenges in superconductivity where we dilute quantities of polar metals? The first challenge is how do we overcome Coulomb repulsion? Remember that in BCS, one of the big problems is that the electrons don't like each other. How do we get them to like each other? Well, of course, in the standard BCS, the phonons act as mediators. The electrons are fast, the phonons are slow. We don't have that. We have that the, we have the opposite situation. Now, another way of getting around that is, of course, to work in the angular momentum chain. Okay. But the experiment on STO seems to indicate that it's a very good S-wave superconductor. And furthermore, as I mentioned to you, it seems to two gap over TC, two delta over TC seems to be the BCS value. Now, the other part of the mystery is that TC seems to increase with proximity to a polar quantum critical point. And this is, uh, this is data from the Cambridge group. And we talked last time about the fact that the critical mode is a transverse optical phonon, and that in the absence of spin orbit coupling, and we just talked about it now, there's negligible direct coupling between the electrons and the soft mode. However, when Gil Lanzerich and his colleagues look at temperature as a function of pressure and drive the superconductors closer to the critical point, it seems to go up. So we have a mystery here because on the one hand, the electrons don't want to couple to the soft phonon. On the other hand, TC is enhanced with this proximity to the polar quantum critical point and actually goes down quite a bit as we go away from it. I say we because I believe science is a collective process. So let me put our idea a little bit in context. Uh, this was doped strontium titanate was found to be superconducting in 1967. So it would be impossible to put all the references, uh, particularly the theoretical proposals to that. However, thankfully my friends, Maria, Jonathan, and Raphael have written a beautiful article in Annals of Physics, which I'm going to uh, I, I put as a reference because that's a very nice review of superconductivity on this material. Okay. But let me just give you an idea of some, some of what's been done, at least conceptually. There was, of course, the extension of conventional BCS. And the first was by Marvin Cohen, who, as we discussed last time, actually predicted this and, and got his experimental colleagues to measure it based on a multi-value, a multi-valley approach. Okay. Then if you remember, they did the band structure, there was strontium tightening single valley. Okay. But that was the basis of the prediction. And his theory and experiment. Okay, so this is the experiment. Then there was work on plasma. Uh, the problem with plasmons is you really need the diet. Okay, there are problems here. I'm not gonna go through the problems. And then at some point uh, in the 70s, um, Nagai posed two phonon processes. And the idea was like you can't couple to a single phonon that breaks inversion symmetry, but you can couple to two phonons and maybe that's something that we should consider. And the philosophy behind this was that to try and copy the essence of what Marvin Cohen was able to do, what Marvin Cohen says in his article is that, look, we have screening. That's a cake or, that's a, a cake or zero phenomenon, a long wavelength phenomenon. Okay? To avoid screening, let's use large K. If you use large K, in his case, is a multi value. Valid. Now, the guy said, Well, what's another way of doing large K? Another way of doing large K to cover the Brunner zone to get around screening is to have two phonons. So he suggested this, and we'll be coming back to that. So these were some of the ideas that were floating around. 
Then people started thinking about quantum physicality. Now, the Rusev and Lewis were the first to draw reference here to bring some of these uh, solar systems to the attention of the quantum critical community. So quantum criticality became important. People started thinking about multiband effects and also the possibility of spin orbit coupling. Okay. And in spin orbit coupling, what we have is we have a coupling that's due to spin orbit. We have a coupling here. We, in the, we can couple directly to the critical phonon if we have this dynamical Rashba coupling. I say dynamical because our polarization is fluctuating. And here I should emphasize that U is displacement. Here, polarization is proportional to the displacement. And if I'm on the disordered side, our electric side, then I'm thinking about a local polarization, not a macroscopic polarization. Okay. So this is sort of the setting for what's going on now. There's a lot, of, been a lot of work on exotic superconductivity with this spin orbit coupling. I should say that what why you might say this is titanium. Why are people thinking about spin orbit coupling? If you look at the band structure, the spin orbit gap is about 20 inches. And so people say, well, look, maybe, maybe we should worry about that. However, remember that the spin orbit gap is long wavelength physics. I've always, I personally think that one should, that this coupling has to be something local, which is high energy physics, all right? So one of the questions I've always asked is, how big is it, okay? And there's a lot about this material we don't know. So how big is it? So with Abhishek and Pavel, we thought, is there an experiment that we can do to measure how big is this spin orbit coupling, okay? So the, this is something that we set out to do and just to give you a flavor for what we were doing. What we said was the following. If you have a system that has a Rashba, dynamical Rashba type coupling, then what it means is, let's consider a very single, simple conduction band. What it means is that we have the soft phonon is taking us from one, one of these bands to the other, okay? Because we, we're dynamical, okay? Remember, we're not in a, in a polar state, we would have true Rashba coupling. Here we're dynamical, so we have fluctuation. Now, okay, now what happens if we turn on a field? If we turn on a field, remember in, in uh, dynamical or in Rashba coupling, we're coupling to the phonon to spin currents. Okay? Now we turn on a field. When we turn on a Zeeman field, we're gonna split the bands. And if we look at our frequency as a function of B, we're going to have two, two, uh, two uh, objects here. We're going to have the dispersion due to our Rashba split bands. And remember, we're, we're also going to have a soft phonon. Okay? We have our soft phonon, we're, up, we're, we're above the transition. We're in the disorder phase. We have a soft phonon. That soft phonon would go to zero at the quantum critical point. And we have these collective modes. Well, at some point, they're going to hybridize. And when they hybridize, what we were able to show is that we could calculate the gap. Because okay, they're going to have an anti property. We can calculate the gap. And that gap will be a function of the coupling. Uh, I called it G before, but here it's lambda. So we calculate the gap. And we worked out that that's accessible with current experimental techniques with reasonable fields. So the point is that if quantum Titan did have this coupling, then if you put it in a mag, and remember, we don't expect usually much action from a magnetic field in a polar metal. Right? But here we're saying, look, if it has Rashba, the dynamical Rashba, then, oh, I'm supposed to go here. We should get hybridization between the collective modes due to the dynamical Rashba and the soft phonon. And that'll give us some gap, which is, uh, which we can, where we can determine what that coupling should be. 
So we did that. And more recently, we've also been working with our Rutgers colleagues, uh, in particular, Karen uh, Rabe and David Vanderbilt and, and Shobit, also one of the postdocs, uh, basically to look at the relative strength and strontium tightening of this two proton coupling and the spinor. And Maria has actually done some work on the spin orbit coupling. And well, in my mind, not surprisingly, it seems that to be pretty small. Again, to me, the fact that you have a big gap doesn't mean that you necessarily have a large spin orbit coupling because that's low energy physics. Okay. The coupling is local, which means it's between like high energy. So, in some sense, what you're asking is you may have a gap. But you want to know as you distort it, which is what our records colleagues are doing, as you distort it, how does that gap change? And they're finding that it's very small. But Maria has already done that. But anyway, so you know, that's my take. Though I must say, some very interesting, uh, some very interesting physics has come out from studying the spin orbit. But I think one of the reasons that we did this project is we wanted an experiment that actually would determine. How large is it? Okay, so now let's get to our ideas. And this is done with Piers and with Pavel. And the key questions are how isotropic superconducting pairing without retardation, how do we get that? And how do we overcome Coulomb repulsion? And our suggestion, which I will, I hope to flesh out with you is that we believe that the interactions between the electrons are mediated by the energy fluctuations of the medium. And I'll tell you a bit more. Um, so what are our guiding observations? Number one, we have very, very strong ionic screening. So very weak Coulomb interaction between the electrons. Remember, we're close to the polar point quantum critical point, the dielectric constant is very large. Okay, so we have very, very weak Coulomb interactions. And the second is that, as we've discussed, the critical mode is the inverse inversion symmetry breaking transverse optical mode, and there's no linear coupling to the charge density. Of course, we're assuming negligible spin orbit. So what this tells us is that the electrons do not directly interact with the zero point fluctuations. The situation is somewhat analogous to, but they know about them. So how do we do that? The situ situation is somewhat analogous to baryons in the cosmos where we know that they interact with zero point fluctuations in some way, but it's not obvious, okay, of course zero point fluctuations are the dark matter. So what is a model for this coupling? Okay. Model is this kind of Hamiltonian where we have a coupling constant, which has dimensions of volume. We have the local energy density. And now we have a term that's proportional to the energy density of the local polarization. Now you might say, wait a minute, you might see something like that before two photons. We're going to get to that. Turns out we're thinking about energy fluctuation. In 3D, as we'll see, that is the same as two phonon exchange because we're weak coupling. We'll talk about that shortly. But our, our contention is energy fluctuations are more general. And the reason they're more general is, as we'll see when we go, to lower dimensions, phonon quasi-particles are not defined. However, energy fluctuations are. And we'll see that, and that's due to the importance of interactions. OK, but what's the model for this coupling? This is the model for the coupling. And let's just look at this a minute. If we look at this a minute, what are we learning? Well, if we put a charge at a site, that's going to suppress the zero point fluctuation. Why is that? Because when we put the charge, the ions are going to be attracted to it, okay? And it's going to change the local spring constant. So what we see here is that the zero point fluctuations are going to be suppressed. 
And similarly, if we have a change here, that's a reduction of the chemical potential of the electrons. Okay. So the fluctuations of the critical phonon energy density near the electrons result in an attractive potential. So once again, the electrons sense the zero point fluctuations through the energy, through their energy. Usually you couple the electrons to a phonon displacement. Okay, here we're coupling them to the phonon energy. So in that sense, it's somewhat similar to the cosmological situation where the idea is that the baryons know about the stream stress energy tensor, but don't couple directly to the dark matter. So what is the action? We have an electronic contribution. We have our electro, uh, energy fluctuation term. And then we have the electrostatic interactions and the polar fluctuations. So first, of course, what happens when we set the coupling to be zero? When we set the coupling to be zero, we integrate over the longitudinal modes. And of course, the quantum critical transverse polar modes are completely decoupled from the electronic degrees of freedom. That's just a way of showing that. Now, what happens when we put on the coupling? Okay, well, this is a dilute system, so you might be worried this is strong coupling. Well, remember that, yes, it's a dilute system. The ratio of the Coulomb and the kinetic energy goes as one over Kf AB, where Kf goes as n to the one third. But once again, we have a very large dielectric function. We're very close to the quantum critical point. So what that tells us is that we have a very small R, Rs. We can, we can consider this a weak coupling. I like that, because that means I can do calculations. Okay. So to lowest order, we look at the kind of from the two phonon exchange to calculate this attractive potential. I'm in 3D now. Okay. The reason it's important to say I'm in 3D is it turns out that the phonon phonon interaction terms give me a logarithmic correction to that. And that's not so important. When we go to 2D, it'll be more important. So now let's make some link to prior work. Two phonon exchange. We talked last time about the fact that one of the very uh, strange things about transport in these polar metal, again, mostly dope, slump, and titanate, is the fact that rho goes like t squared. Now you might say, what's the big deal? T squared is fairly liquid. The problem is it continues as t squared well beyond the Fermi temperature. Okay? And Abhishek and Dmitry Basov not Dmitry Maslow, sorry, Dmitry Maslow, um, uh, actually proposed the two photon exchange as a way to understand this. And it's so dilute, actually, the irony of their theory is it works quite well at high temperatures, but at low temperatures, we don't have umqua. And so as a result, ironically, their theory works much better at high temperatures than at low temperatures, but it's the best we've got right now for this. Once all phonons are frozen out, it really should be exponential. Okay. But you know, above the F, they really become stable. And it was proposed as a mechanism for superconductivity early on by Nagai, and I mentioned that earlier, and more recently by Dirk Vanderbilt and his colleagues um, when he was analyzing optical conductivity. But none of them thought about, neither of these thought about. Quantum critic, the quantum criticality um, that did come into Abhishek and Dimitri's work, but not in these proposals for superconductivity. So what we thought we'd do is, because this had been so successful in looking at transport, normal state transport, we thought we would look at what Nagai had done and see whether we could make sense of what's seen in the dilute quantum critical phase. So now coupling to energy fluctuations, g finite. The first thing you get 
which comes out about very simply from this, is when you put in a finite electron density, you find that you get a new frequency, a uh, frequency as a function of n, which is the original transverse optical frequency plus, plus an additional term. And this is a very nice way of showing uh, what is intuitive, namely we can suppress the polar state by charge doping. Okay. Now, this has been seen for a long time. This is actually data from Lona and Shirani, I think in the 60s, I forgot the reference, okay. But uh, capital, uh, the ionic, the plasma frequency, ionic plasma. Yes. And the key point is here that this hadn't been explained by other models. And this is just an easy thing. Okay. So this is consistent with observation. What we do is we dope the system and we suppress the polar state. Of course, we also move the quantum critical point. Okay. But we have to include this in our calculations, how our, our soft phonon frequency is changed by putting in the electrons. Okay, and this is consistent with observation. Good. Now, the energy fluctuation coupling cannot be. Yes, very important. Yeah. It's a so now, now that it's in, in our case, in our case, but it can be negative in other materials, mm -hmm. but it is positive for strontium tightening. But you're right, you could, I mean, we just took it to be positive because, yeah. because of this measurement. But you're right, it could be negative. Okay, so energy fluctuation, the energy fluctuation coupling cannot be perceived without exactly Okay, and by the way, one thing we had to check is that our stability of the thermodynamic systems. And the way that we knew about this people and coupling is we actually checked it before when we were looking for non civil liquid behavior. It's very stable. And that's something about strontium titanate that, as far as we can tell from quantum oscillation experiments and all that, it's a fairly good thing. All right, so the good news is that because we're recoupling, we can do perturbation theory. Okay, so we can just consider those two phonon exchanges again in three dimensions. And what do we find? We find that the interaction that's relevant for electron pairing that comes from this perturbative treatment has this form, okay? And the key thing here to notice is that we have three distinct momentums. We have three distinct energy scales. We have omega T. We have CSKF. CS is the speed of sound. We average it over the Fermi, the full uh, Brion zone, partly because we have some interesting band structures there. And we have EF. Okay. So the take home message right away is that large, not surprisingly, two photons, large momenta contribute. Remember, that was very important for Marvin Cohen. Large momentum contribute when we see that. So let's just get a feeling for how this works by Fourier transforming it and looking at the effective pairing attraction. So if we look at the effective pairing attraction, we have log of E versus log of the density. And we have three different regimes. In regime one, which is very low density, and this is on a log scale. The dominant energy scale is the soft phonon frequency. Okay, again, the phonon frequency that has been adapted for charge density. Okay, so this is the important scale. Now, you notice here that if we look at our effective attraction, we have no Q dependence, no omega dependence. That means we're local in space, local in time. Now we go to the next regime. And of course, the way I go from these different regimes is omega t goes as n to the one half. That came from our previous equation where we showed that omega squared changed with n. So omega t goes as n to the one half. Then two cs kf goes as n to the one third. And then ef goes as n to the two thirds. So that's how we determine what energy scale is dominant. Now let's go to this intermediate density scale. Here, 2CSKF is the dominant one. And here our pairing interaction is instantaneous, but has spatial dependence. 
And finally, as we go to higher density, so there's no omega dependence here. We don't have to worry about dynamics, but we do have to worry about space. And then finally, in the last one, we have no Q dependence, but we have time dependence. Okay, so here we have dynamics. Okay, so those are the three different regimes. Now we are we focus on this regime in our in our calculation, partly because the regime. The lower energy regime corresponds to the superconductivity that has not been confirmed with fault. It's really just elementary. So we've, we're looking at the low density uh, bulk superconductivity. So what do we get? What we get is for low carrier density close to the polar quantum critical point, we'll get an attractive electron electron interaction, which overcomes the Coulomb repulsion. And it does lead to superconductivity. So what's the attractive part of the effective electron coupling? Well, it looks something like this. And you can see right away that we have a dome-shaped behavior with Kf as, uh, lambda, uh, as omega t. That's, that's equivalent of like a, a, Debye, a Debye frequency, but for the transverse optical mode over 2Cs. Okay. And we see right away, we have Kf here. Kf, of course, goes at n to the one third. We see right away that we're going to get some sort of dome-like behavior. Okay. Now, close, we have to be very close to the quantum critical point for this to uh, beat out the Coulomb repulsion, okay? Because close to the quantum critical point, the dielectric constant is very high. So thankfully, Gorkov, one of Mork's heroes, has worked out this superconductivity for us. Okay, he worked it out. This is instantaneous, but with space. He worked it out. So, and I was thrilled to see a young picture of Gorkov. I hadn't seen that before. Okay. Um, TC goes like EF to, is proportional. I think there's a 0.3 or something, E to the minus one over lambda. The good news for us is that E delta over TC is 3.5. Okay, that's what Harold Huang sees experimentally. And so what we get is that TC has a dome-like behavior as a function of carrier density. So remember, Kf goes as n to the one third. Okay, so that's what we get. Okay, so what happens when we go to experiment? So this is experiment and Pavel has fit our ideas. So TC versus density. And I should point out um, in, in, in comparing to the experiment before we got a G of about 0.55 G over a zero cubed. Here we get a G over a zero cubed of about 0.68. These are, these crosses are the experimental points. Um, this line here is for STO, which is when we have our soft mode at about 1.4 MeV. This is when we include Coulomb interactions. Here is without Coulomb interactions. You might ask, why are we showing without Coulomb interactions? Many of our um, colleagues in the field seem to forget to put in Coulomb interactions. And we wanted to show that, yes, we too can get very good agreement without Coulomb interactions, but of course, it doesn't actually really. Okay, but the curve, the black curve is the one. And this green curve is what we expect if we apply pressure and drove it to the quantum critical point. Now, what's this red line? This red line is basically the boundary of validity of our calculation. <laughs> so, uh, is that we haven't included dynamical effects. So people are one of the yes, yes. So what happens is we assume that EF is less than two CS KF. So we've ignored dynamics completely. We've only done spatial. But dynamical effects have to be included above here. Okay, we haven't done that. But actually, the agreement isn't super bad, particularly if you throw out the Coulomb repulsion, but there's no justification. But why does it go down? Pardon? This, this will still go down. That's because of the shape of the dope. Remember, we have a Kf log 1 over Kf. All that we, we did the calculation, assuming that dynamics weren't there. But what I'm saying is there's no justification beyond that. No, you I'm see, this, this will get. Right. So it'll go down. 
because also we included Coulomb, right? So it's going to come down. It's and we have an n to the one third in front. And then this in itself is a dome, right? And then I just don't see. Okay. Um, that's right and when the log goes to zero it becomes one right mm -hmm. so this is a dome unto itself um and it comes out very naturally out of all of this but my point is that we have no right to talk beyond this density, okay? And actually, I have to say that when we first did this, and I give Pablo a lot of credit, we had a problem with the factor of two, and we thought we fit the whole thing. And then one of the referees said, wait a minute. And they were right. Yes. So we have no right to do that. And where do the dynamical effects come in through the Remember, we only looked at the ionic contributions to the dielectric function. But as you go to higher density, you have to take into account the electronic contributions to the dielectric function. And those electronic contributions to the dielectric function have dynamics to them. And we have no right to not include them there. So what I can say is what we've been able to do is in the in the low density part where there are where there's bulk superconductivity, our approach can explain things. But the next step is really to incorporate. The dynamical effects, in, for example, uh, the group at Cambridge, Andrew Chubikov, there are lots of people who've looked at dynamical effects. We have to include dynamical effects and merge them with what we've done so far in a systematic way. And that's what's next. Okay. Now, so what do we have so far? We have that two, thanks to uh, Lev Gorkov, we know that two delta over TC is 3.53. We also can explain how, as we get to the quantum critical point, we can explain what DTC over DP is. We get about 0.1 Kelvin per kilobar. Gill and colleagues get about 0.06. Okay, so that's good. Now, what can we predict? Well, one thing we can predict is that close to a for 2D superconductor, the proximity to the quantum critical point will lead to an even stronger enhancement, okay? So this is, uh, this is what we are for strontium titanate. And if we send it closer to the quantum critical point, we'll have a real enhancement, okay? Now, why is this important? This is where the energy fluctuations versus two phonon exchange becomes important. In 2D, we can, in the distinction between the two becomes important when we go to lower dimensions. Okay. We're in weak coupling. And the distinction comes when we're looking at this emergent attraction. Because in three dimensions, the phonon phonon interaction gives us a logarithmic correction. We're not so worried about that. However, in 2D, we get a singularity. We actually get an anomalous dimension. Okay. As it turns out, we're very lucky because the Fermi liquid is marginal in 2D but the phonon interaction, phonon -phonon interaction actually stabilizes it. Everything we've done assumes we have a Fermi liquid. Now in 2D, our phonon quasi particles are not well-defined, but energy fluctuations are well-defined. And so that's where it's a little bit different. Uh, so the importance of nonlinear phonon phonon interactions in 2D are crucial. And uh, that's why we can talk about uh, the um, energy fluctuations. So here we're focusing on a low carrier uh, regime where the weak coupling approach is okay. In 3D, the two are the same. In 2D, they are not. And we think of this as a sort of first step towards looking at non perturbative energy fluctuations. Now, I'd like to end with what are the distinguishing features of the energy fluctuation mechanism because you know, there are many, there are many proposals around and not that many materials to test them on. So yet, so first of all, in the energy fluctuation mechanism, we expect 
resistivity, the dominant coupling to be due to energy fluctuations. So the resistivity should go like T squared. We also expect that we have a suppression. Pardon? I think it's literally just two phonons. So this is going down to low temperatures? No, this is, I'm talking about higher temperatures. I don't, I don't know how to handle it at lower temperatures. I'm sorry. I'm just saying that if you have it at high temperatures, then you know that the energy fluctuation mechanism is probably at play. That's all I'm saying. At low temperatures, I don't know how to get around that. That's still, I think, an outstanding question. Then the suppression of the polar state with doping. And with N-dope strontium titanate, something we're happy about is that the couplings that we use, the couplings that Abhishek and Dimitri used for the transport, the coupling that was used many years ago by Jonah and Chirami, and the coupling we used to fit to strontium titanate are all within the same ballpark. It's not like one is 100 and one is minus 10 to the minus five. They're all in the same ballpark. So that's good news. So to me, one of the appealing aspects of this is it has a unified approach to different properties. Okay. But you know, there's still things to be done. Um, it gives us a scaling of TC with the phonon frequency and sensitivity to carrier density at low doping concentrations. And the other thing is, this is, this is a, a scenario where the normal state near the polar quantum critical point is a Fermi liquid. Okay. In many of the spin orbit coupling treatments, you get anisotropic pairing and you also get non pairing which is, of course, very interesting. Um, but in our case, we have a Fermi liquid. Okay, so just to summarize, um, I, I, on this part, um, the idea we, behind looking at superconductivity and dilute quantum critical polar metals is that there, the challenge is that the Coulomb repulsion is heavily screened and the critical polar mode decouple from the charge. Um, we think that uh, a plausible scenario, at least for low carrier density is that attractive electron-electron coupling and it overcomes the Coulomb uh, repulsion at low densities. We got a pairing instability and enhancement of superconductivity uh, near quantum polar quantum critical points in both two and three dimensions. And one of the questions that we think might be interesting to pursue is if you suppress TC in a polar metal, could you get a new low density kind of superconductivity? So with that, I thank you very much. And I also thank all the organizers and all of you. And I will get back to you on your set of things. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, um, to be honest, we haven't really thought about that. Okay, all that we know is that they're S wave, but we haven't thought about the spatial structure. At least I haven't. Pierce, do you have anything to say about that? It's boring. It's, it's BCS. I mean, it's BCS. It's BCS. It's BCS. Because it's relatively long range, doesn't make any. No, I don't think so. It's well screened. Um, there's no, there's no unusual symmetry to it. Um, unfortunately, um, we'd love that to be the case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And to write the maximum of TC that we even here exactly as that scale. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, never mind that might be a Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what do we need to hold the other one? Only the team's again. Oh, yeah, it's all set. Only the team's Uh, It's like we need to hold the other one.
Yeah, isn't it the energy, the, the energy of the transverse fold? The transverse one, it's the highest, it's the highest frequency. Like with the bi-energy, the bi-frequency for the transverse mode. Okay, so it's something on top of. Yeah, it's a cutoff for the transverse mode. Okay, so therefore, um, and then my limit is cut off, and then, uh, so CS times, so, so you should be able to cut off the measure to the wrong way. Pardon? I'm just trying to realize what the momentum scale there is. Right, there's a momentum scale. I mean, you can see this, right? And if you want to get the cut cutoff and CS is a sound velocity, uh, then I suppose that the momentum is of the order of the gray on the zone size. Something like that. But then yeah. KF at the maximum would have to be the order of the gray on the zone size. I thought it already was no, it's much, it's much smaller. It's much smaller. So how do you get the maximum edge? Uh, this edge? I mean, we have a here, you have a spectrum. Oh, oh, this is not like an acoustic model. No, no, no. no. It's, it's, it is. Uh, it basically is. is how, how does it disperse? I mean, yeah, that's what it is. CS is what it is. So, I think this was the whole issue. I, I'm a bit rusty on this, but yeah, so I thought it was the issue of the so velocity be being much higher yeah, so at low we have a, Q we have a very and then flattening high out later. At low Q and then it flattens out. Uh, and, and that's why, and that's why Pablo decided to take the average CS versus the CS uh -huh. right here. Because it's actually, well, to be fair, this is Pablo. Not as high as I should be thought about that, but they took the CS right at the speed of zero. CS is the speed of sound. So oh, just yeah. the, no, of, of our transverse. I don't know. It's, it's a slope. slope. Yeah. Yes, it's a slope. It's right. It's a yeah. slope. Yeah. And the point is that it has a very high slope, and then it flattens out. Uh -huh. And so what they did was they originally, uh, they originally took this slope. And what Pavel said is, look, we have to integrate in this sort of the bipartisan that we have to integrate with what we have to do on average of the whole group. And that part down there is that part. And that's actually what Nagai did. But it is a kind of numerical factor, but when cubed gives you a much lower density, right. I guess. Yeah. So, so, so it's and then and that's why there's a small moment when scale is associated with the yes. 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 yes, that's exactly yes. right. Yes. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So yeah. that's yeah. the answer to your question about yeah. that. Yeah. Because, um, and that's specific to quantum mm -hmm. And that's something that I think Pablo knows. Mm -hmm. I mean, this all came from actually a talk. Mm -hmm. He gave a talk and said it wasn't possible. I didn't even realize it. He'd just been looking at the answer. I'm happy. So there is, you mentioned several times dimensional. Of course, there is Yes. Um, and one of the problems of state statement as well, is well, he sees the same thing, so the same mechanism. I never understood that as statement, but let's assume it would be correct. Well, I think so would you also be able to apply your theory to LUS theory? Well, first of all, we haven't really thought about mm -hmm. that, but for Schlock, he put it here in the microphone. Oh, sorry. We haven't, uh, the honest truth is, I haven't thought about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Borshlovsky and one of his students, one of his students gave us a talk giving yeah. reasons for why this should be the case, but I didn't find it completely convincing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, first of all, I would think that you'd have constraints on the phonons involved, so I don't know how to handle this interfacial thing, right? Because we assume yeah. three-dimensional phonon fluctuations, there so you'd have to have constraints. Um, so the honest answer is, I don't know. I mean, TCs are very similar. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. So we thought we would just try looking at what happens in the 2D film case, and but we didn't think about the length of the LAO-STO. Piers, do you have any wise words to say about this? Okay. He doesn't have anything to say about that. That's unusual, right? <laughs> um, so I can't, I can't really comment on that. There are all kinds of surface state issues and all of that stuff that I've never completely understood there. And so I would be hesitant to just apply that 
without really understanding that system better. I mean, the charge counting I've never quite understood. Evolution of the uh, P for propagator with itself. That's right. And then it's of course, uh, if it's smoothened then the beta dependent, yes. it will be convoluted. And, and, you, that's okay. and then at the end, it's like one over x to the fourth. Right. So it, that's that's exactly time, right. Yeah. But then you have to take into account all the different atoms. And and we and I, I wanted to be clear that we looked at a particular cutoff. And to be fair, I, I should have put it in the in the thing. We looked at oops, we, we looked at um the inter, the intermediate region, which is what I call the Gorkop region. Yeah. Okay. Now there was recently a paper by Michel uh, by Michel Feigelman and one of his students, and they looked at this, but they looked in the dilute region. So let's just get there. And they didn't take into account Coulomb. Um, oh, We're getting there. They didn't, and one of the reasons we didn't go to the really low density was that we don't think superconductivity. Cameron told us don't even go near there. That superconductivity is just filamentary. So they they looked at this region here. And there, of course, calculationally, it's much more straightforward because you're local in space, local in time. Um, and, and they found some, some work, but they extended theirs to a density that's beyond what you're allowed to do for that. So we focused on this region and you see that that red line that I gave is when we go into that region and we did not do that. And you no, no region. One of these data functions that are constant, which I mentioned, that is not integrated by strain. Yes, that's what I think he's saying. So we're at a one over x cubed, but we're instantaneous. And so that's, I mean, that's how we get around the standard question. Certainly, Andre Tubakov always asks me when I go to the thing if you're quantum critical, why aren't you taking into account dynamics? But we're not because we're in the right density regime. Okay. But we can't answer that properly here. And again, physically, it's because we're only, we're not taking into account the dynamical aspect, the electron contribution to the dielectric function. And that's next. But we thought we'd try start simple. Okay. Yes, go please. Uh, well, if you, when you say we haven't, I didn't quite understand, net dipole in the unit cell, or are you asking about the anti ferromagnetic? Yes, it is. So, so in an anti ferromagnetic uh, the critical uh, node would be a prime cube. And so that's what we just did. But you want it in the same unit cell, so it's officially the same. Oh, you're in the same unit cell? Yes. Uh, I, I guess we just think about the average for the unit cell. So I guess it would be all right, but that's a complicated, that's, that's, that's more complicated than this. And I'm short length for the unit cell. I don't know if materials would have that. I, I might just mention the other one, but it, this is the other one. No, but that's in a different unit cell. Right. Yeah. That's like an anti unit cell. That's a different unit sure. Okay, anything else I can, and I owe you an answer, you are telling me that. Okay. All right, thank you everyone. I think we should thank the organizers. All right, um, are we going to have the discussion now? Um, here's a question for the group. Would you like to have a brief discussion of some of the things that came up in the last few weeks? Should we do it now? Should we do oh, there was a point. The lunch or should we not do it at all? Um, we could easily have a sort of 10, 15 minute discussion just to get some 
coming now.